testing. Can you hear me? No. Do me a favor and run upstairs. Tell them the uh, sound is not working. No. It's upstairs, one floor up. There's an IT office right as you go up the stairs, you turn to your right, it should be on the right there. In, in, just tell them that the sound is not working. I don't think the sound is working, is it? Is it working? I just sent him off on an air and he didn't have to go on, so. Okay. You didn't know a basketball game could be dangerous to your portfolio, right? Yeah. You found the example last week of your, uh, you know, as I said, you know, it's classic example of firm specific risk. You think you're protected until you're not but nothing you can do about discount rate. So last session, we talked about risk that matters and risk that doesn't, okay? From the perspective of a diversified investor. I'm gonna suggest a task that, might, that, that you might find useful to kind of allow you to differentiate. Just pick up the Wall Street Journal on any given day and start reading through the news stories. And with each one, I want you to stop and ask, is this firm specific risk or is this market risk? Might sound like a waste of time, but you'll be amazed at the end of even reading one day's paper, how much of the news you read is company specific. I'll give you an example. On Friday, Kraft Heinz reported a collapse in earnings, right? Stock price collapsed. Company specific risk or market risk? Obviously company specific risk. Does the fact, I got it, thank you, it's working. Yeah, got things. Okay. Does it make a difference that Warren Buffett is one of the largest investors in Kraft Heinz from the perspective of firm specific and market risk? Probably not, but for some people it might mean the end of the world, right? Because to them what Warren Buffett says is about the entire market. So if he makes a mistake, the world is essentially going to end. That's a gray area. China trade talks. Thank you. China trade talks. Uh, just some positive, I mean, the smoke signals have been coming out for I don't know how many months, Mo positive, negative. Positive smoke signals over the weekend. Company-specific risk or market risk? Market risk, right? Why? Because it's China. And the reason I say that if Nigerian trade talks were sending smoke signals out, it might not be market risk because only oil companies or a subset of companies might be exposed to that. And that's what I want you to do is read the news story and, and from a general perspective, make reading the news an active pursuit rather than passive. Every news story, don't take it as a news story. Ask yourself, everything has a corporate finance spin to it. Put the corporate finance spin on it because that's how things get cemented. So last session, we also started on risk free rates, right? If you have a, an entity that is viewed as default free, and we use AAA as our proxy for them, it's a cheating, but we did it anyway. We said you can yet take the government bond rate, preferably a long-term government bond, why? Because much of corporate finance and valuation is long-term, and just use the government bond rate. So we use the T-bond rate as a risk-free rate for US dollars. For euros, we use the German euro bond rate, and again, be very clear about why we're using the German euro bond rate. It's because we want a default-free rate in euros. We can't use the Greek rate, the Spanish rate, the Portuguese rate, or even the French rate, because they all have default risk. But then we got to difficult currencies. 
Difficult because there is no default free entity in that currency. Use the example of the Indian rupee. You can look up a government bond rate, but you cannot use that as your risk-free rate because the Indian government is default risk. So here's what we did. We estimated a default spread for the Indian government. I think it was 2.25%. We subtracted that from the government bond rate to come up with the risk-free rate. But at that time, I mean, you say, where did that default spread come from? Because if you have the default spread, getting to risk-free rate is easy. I sent you my, the, the in-practice video on how I went through this process. But let me give you a very quick summary of the three ways you can get a sovereign default spread. The first is if your government has dollar-denominated or euro-denominated bonds, you just got lucky. Let's take as an example the Brazilian government in November of 2013. 4.25% was a 10-year dollar-denominated bond rate issued by the Brazilian government. You're saying, how does that help? Because I know what the risk-free rate is in US dollars. I have a T-bond rate. The difference between the 4.25% that I observe for the Brazilian bond and what I observe for the T-bond has to be a default spread. And I can do this for any government that has dollar-denominated bonds. If you gave me a Polish euro-denominated bond, and there are Polish euro-denominated bonds, what would I compare that to to get a default spread for Poland? Not the T-bond rate, but the German euro bond rate. Basically, as long as I have a default free rate, I can compare them. This works for about 25 countries, which have dollar or euro denominated bonds. Much of Asia, for instance, you don't get India issuing dollar denominated bonds or euro denominated So this approach will not work for them. But for those countries where you can find a dollar or euro bond, you can get a default spread by looking at the difference between that rate and a US T bond rate or a German euro bond rate. Until about 15 years ago, this was the only way I could get default spreads, which meant that my sample size was always about 20, 25, comp 25 countries. Starting about 15 years ago, there was a market-based measure of default risk that emerged. It's called the sovereign CDS market. Basically, it's an insurance market. Here's how it works. Let's say you have a Brazilian bond and you want to buy protection against default. That's insurance. You can go to the CDS market and buy protection. Keyword is buy. So when you buy protection, what am I going to make you do? I'm going to make you pay. So let's assume that a Brazilian government bond is at 4.5%. You want to buy protection against default. You can go to the sovereign CDS market, and the sovereign CDS spread is an annual spread. So basically what they will ask you to do, in this case it was 2.5%, is to take 2.5% out of, remember you're collecting 4.5% or 4.25% on the, on the, or 4 on the Brazilian bond. I'm going to ask you to turn over 2.5% to me. In return, what do I offer you? I offer you protection against default risk. It's a market-based measure. That's now available for about 70 countries. The sovereign CDS market is not perfect. It has its flaws. One of its most significant flaws is there is counterparty risk. You know what counterparty risk is? Normally, when you buy futures and forwards markets, there's no counterparty risk because the exchanges you know, make sure that they collect money from the investors and, and hold it as backup. The sovereign CDS market has counterparty risk, which means you can buy insurance, but the insurance is only as good as the credit worthiness of the person selling you the insurance. In fact, this entire market almost collapsed in 2008 because Lehman was one of the biggest sellers of insurance in this market. And if you bought insurance from Lehman in 2008, God help you. You're in the crisis. You say, I'm going to collect insurance. This is great. I bought insurance. You go out there, Lehman's the insurer. So it is a problem. It's not an overwhelming problem. But having a sovereign CDS spread has expanded my sample from 25 to 70. That's the first benefit. The second is I now have a number I can look at on a minute-by-minute -minute basis to see what the market is thinking. So there was a Turkish coup a couple of years ago, the attempted coup. The CDS market immediately reacted. If a, if a president or a prime minister is assassinated, the CDS market immediately reacts. I get an updated number that reflects what the market thinks. It has all those pluses, it's updated, and all the minuses, which means sometimes it's going to overreact, it's going to do strange things, but I now have a second measure of default risk. And for Brazil in November of 2013, that number was 2.5%. So now I have two measures of default spread for Brazil already. 1.5% coming from the government bond, and 2.5% coming from the sovereign CDS market. 
There are a lot of countries, though, which have neither a sovereign CDS, nor do they have dollar or euro denominated bonds. India in 2006 did not have either. Saying, what do I do now? If you have a sovereign rating for your country, remember Moody's and S&P rate about 150 countries. So there's 80 countries which have neither CDS spreads nor a dollar bond. Here's what I can do. I can take your sovereign rating and have a lookup table. You know what a lookup table is, right? You tell me what your rating is, I'll tell you what. You're saying, where did that lookup table come from? Those 70 CDS spreads that I had, I had ratings for those countries, so essentially I took what I observed in the market and created a lookup table because I know there are 90 other countries out there where I will not have a CDS spread or a dollar bond. So in the lookup table, if you look at the rating for Brazil, which is BAA2 in November of 2013, the default spread would have been 2%. 1.5%, 2.5%, 2%. Here you got lucky. The numbers were all close enough that you probably said, oh, it doesn't matter that much, and probably doesn't. But in 2015, the, if you looked at the spread, the CDS had gone to 5%. So this was after the car wash, the political scandals in Brazil. The, but the rating had stayed sticky because ratings agencies were slow to adjust. And the government bond was not that liquid, so it didn't reflect it as well. So you saw a divergence in the spreads. At which point you're saying, which one should I use? Whichever one you use, stick with it all the way through and you're going to be okay. It sounds like a strange thing to say because 5% is very different from 2.5%. You're saying, I'll get a very different risk-free rate. Don't worry, it'll take care of itself because there are other numbers that are going to depend on the choice you make here. And as long as you stay consistent, it's going to be okay. What you cannot do is move back and forth between the different spreads. In fact, if you want to average the three, if that makes you feel good, go for it. In this case, averaging the three would have given you 2% as well. But the default spread is what I need to come up with a risk-free rate in the local currency. Any questions on default spreads? You're saying, what if a country does not have a rating? We'll talk about that. I, most of the time, you're not even thinking. I'll tell you what countries, North Korea doesn't have a rating. If you're thinking about doing business in North Korea, you're out of your mind in the first place. <laughs> But if you want a hurdle rate, I'll, I'll give you ways of, come, of getting there. But there are some countries, and they, these are called frontier markets. Syria, North Korea, Sudan. And you can go through the list of countries, and we'll talk about what to do with those countries in a few minutes. But for the moment, at least deal with 160 countries that have ratings, and you can get default spreads for those countries. So now let me list out what the risk-free rates look like. First, in those currencies where I could find a default-free entity. So, I'm sorry. So these are sovereigns with default risk. I've done the cleaning up. So in November of 2013, these are risk-free rates in currencies ranging from the Taiwanese dollar to the Brazilian real. So if this were a contest, Brazil won the contest of having the highest risk-free rate. It's a contest you don't want to win, but it's a, it's a contest they won anyway. But notice that risk-free rates, these are all emerging market currencies, and the risk-free rates are different. In fact, if I looked at risk-free rates across the board, the risk-free rates vary across currencies. This was the question I wanted you to think about over the weekend, and I'm sure you spent all weekend thinking just about this question. Okay? So I'm going to ask the question. Let's see if you can if you come up with the answer. So for sovereign which have no default risk, I can look at the government bond, come up with the risk-free rate. For sovereigns with default risk, I can clean up the government bond, come up with the risk-free rate. But when I'm done, my risk-free rates are all different. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? Notice I didn't ask you why government bond rates vary across currencies, because then you have an out, right? Risky governments have high government bond rates, safe governments. Have, I'm saying take risk out of the process. Assume I've cleaned up for default risk. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? Anybody want to give it a shot? Go ahead. Inflation. That's it? That is the only reason. And once you identify it, the currency code is cracked. And here's why. High inflation currencies will have high risk-free rates. Low inflation currencies will have low risk-free rates. And deflationary currencies could have what? Negative risk-free rates. They're, I mean, you know how often people struggle. How can risk-free rates be negative? They can be negative if you're in an economy where there is deflation and very low growth. And the reason that is so critical is once you identify it, you can see why currencies don't matter. 
in corporate finance and valuation. Let's say you took an Indian company and decided to do your project entirely in Indian rupees. Inflation is higher in the rupees, so your risk-free rate is going to be higher, your hurdle rates are higher, your cost of equity is higher, your cost of capital is higher. That's bad, right? Higher discount rates. But then when you do your cash flows, they're also going to be in rupees, and the same inflation that pushed up your discount rate is also going to push up your cash flows. If you switch to a low inflation currency and decide to do the same project, the exact same project in dollars, you'll have a lower discount rate. That's a good news but you also have much lower growth rates in your cash flows because you don't have inflation giving you the helping hand. And if you switch to Swiss francs and do everything in Swiss francs, I'll give you the really good news. Your risk-free rate could actually be negative, in which case your cost of equity and capital are going to be tiny. But then when you do your growth rates and your cash flows, it's going to show up as well. The problem, though, is people are not always careful about how they bring inflation into the analysis. Later on, when we do project analyses, I'll talk about one of the mechanisms that people screw up on. Because if I have cash flows in rupees, and I have a discount rate in dollars, and I want to convert the rupee cash flows into dollars for the next 10 years, what do I need? I need expected exchange rates. And to get the expected exchange rates, you're going to look outside. You said, let me talk to an expert. Let me look at the forward market. You could look at the forward market, but after about two years, you're going to run out of forward rates. We have to, to be consistent about how we estimate exchange rates. And I'll give away part of the game and come back and be less abstract. If I believe inflation is the driver for differences across currencies, how should I get exchange rates? Have you heard of purchasing power parity? Sounds fancy, right? But if I have a currency with an inflation rate of 7% and another currency with an inflation rate of 2%, with purchasing power parity, you know what's going to happen, right? The higher inflation rate currency will depreciate roughly 5%, that differential inflation, every year. And if you do that, you will get exactly the same value to the nth decimal point, where the value company in US dollars, Indian rupees, Indonesian rupees, you pick the currency, it doesn't matter. And that's really good news, because it means you're not going to get five different answers with five different currencies. The one thing you cannot do is mix and match. And I'll give you a very simple example of how easy it is to end up mixing and matching. A student of mine from like 25 years ago is now the CFO of a big US company. So he calls me a couple of years ago. He's very proud of himself. He says, look, you know, we just bought an Indian company. And I remembered everything we did in the corporate finance class. I knew he was lying because nobody remembered, including me, everything I did in the corporate finance class. So I said, OK, what did you do? He said, we bought an Indian company. And we decided to do everything in dollars because we're more comfortable in dollars. And you told us it's OK to pick. And I said, yeah, you can do everything in dollars. And he said, we came up. He, he went through elaborate detail in how he computed the cost of capital in dollars, emphasizing the fact that he remembered the country risk factor. He brought it all in. And I said, OK, that sounds really good. And he said, I was careful about also converting the cash flows into dollars. And I said, what exactly did you do? He said, I took last year's cash flows and I converted them into dollars using the current exchange rate. And I said, that sounds OK. And he said, we applied a growth rate to those cash flows. And I said, where do you get the growth rate? He said, I asked the Indian company managers to give me an estimate of future growth because they know the business really well. And I said, that's good. You ask somebody who knows a lot. Did you remember to ask them the key question? What's the key question? When you ask an Indian manager to give you a growth rate, what currency do you think he's going to think of? We all have a frame of reference. It's not like they're trying to be deceptive. If you ask somebody, what's a growth rate in your company, they don't convert things in their heads. They give it to you in whatever currency they tend to think in. He said, does it matter? And I said, you probably got a growth rate in rupees. He said, what does that all mean? I said, you probably paid three times more than you should have for the company. <laughs> It's, all, it's too late now. View it as a sunk cost and move on. But don't mention this to anybody else. <laughs> but you can see how easy it is when people are in conversations. If you're not explicit about currencies to end up mixing and matching, you have Chinese managers on one side and US managers on the other. You're talking about growth rates and cash flows. You have to be explicit when you talk about growth rates as to what currency you're talking in. Because you have no idea what the person on the other side of the table is thinking. 
currency consistency, something that you have to think about all the way through both corporate finance and valuation. So that's a risk-free rate. Any questions about the risk-free rate? So in a sense, we no, any question, if you can risk-free rates be negative? Yes, for con com currency. Can you work with negative risk-free rates? No, I don't see a problem. I'll put in a negative risk-free rate, it's going to push down my discount rate, but my cash flows and growth rates are going to be in the same currency. Let's move on to the second component. Because remember, this entire process, we're trying to get an expected return using the capital asset pricing model. We've got the risk-free rate nailed down. Let's talk about the equity risk premium. I'll give you what I'm trying to measure, and then you're going to see very quickly why it's going to be difficult to come up with an estimate of it. The equity risk premium is what investors collectively demand for investing in equities as a class as opposed to something risk-free. So think about it. Right now, the T-bond rate is about 2.65%. When I ask you what the equity risk premium is, I'm asking you how much more than 2.65% you would demand for investing in equities as a class. And if you think about what's going to drive that number, here are some of the factors that are going to kick in. First, it's going to be a function of how risk-averse investors are. And what drives risk aversion? Fear, worry, concerns. It could also be a function of what you think the average risk equity is. So basically, when I ask you what's an average risk equity, some people might say it's Walmart, other people might say it's Microsoft, the third person might say Facebook. So it's going to be a function of risk aversion and what you perceive as average risk. So let's take a closer look at risk aversion. Let's do some generalities about risk aversion. I mean, there have been studies over the last 100 years probably on how risk aversion varies across the population. Let's start easy. Old versus young, who do you think is more risk averse? Older people, why? Probably because they have more things to worry about, right? Now you have other, you have responsibilities, you, have, you, you know the end of life is coming at some point, you have pension funds, et cetera. So you see the implication of that is investors in a market age, what should happen to the equity risk premium in that market? It should go up. Japan and Europe have a problem that goes beyond just a consumption economy problem. They have aging populations and holding all else constant as populations age, holding all its constant, your equity risk premium is going to be higher. Here's a trickier question, perhaps even a sensitive question. Men versus women, who's more risk averse? You're awfully quick to jump in and say women. <laughs> what do you think? Young women are more risk averse than young men. A fact I can attest to because I have three sons and a daughter, and the only person whose car I will get into when that person is driving is my daughter. <laughs> Until men get to be about 25, I think they're a little disabled when it comes to the, the, how they think about risk. In fact, if you think about bad risk taking, your worst possible population is 25 to 30 year old males. Now do you see why trading has a problem? You walk into a trading room, you look around, what do you see? A lot of young men. Just about six years ago, Society General had this huge scandal. Seven, I don't even know how you have a $7 billion trading loss. <laughs> and of course, it comes out eventually. And you know everybody's talking about how do we stop these scandals. So I wrote a blog post only half in jest. I said, here's my risk management proposal for banks. You know what the biggest check on the risk taking of a 25 year old male is? His mother. <laughs> I said here's what you should do. Take every trader, hire the mother to sit behind the trader while they trade. <laughs> you might have to pay a hundred thousand dollars to the mom to sit around, but she's going to what are you doing now? That doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> eh? You'd be amazed. If you're going to save seven billion, I think that's a good enough investment to make. There's a problem when you get a homogeneous group becoming your dominant group in you. And this is true for any kind of business you're in. Because there's a certain so if you're, you know, if you're ending up with 70-year-old women in a company, the, you're going to get the exact opposite problem. You're going to get too, too much risk aversion. It's actually a kind of indirect corporate finance argument for diversity in the workplace, right? 
Because if you get too many people thinking the same way about risk, you're going to get much bigger problems in terms of risk taking. So your age matters. In fact, let me complete the story with men and women. Young women are more risk averse than young men, but as you age, risk aversion starts to even out, with one little exception. Women tend to still be more risk averse about small bets than men. This is why you can never make a football bet with a woman, because they have to think through, you know, it's $10, I have to think through. You know, but men seem to be pretty casual about small bets as they age. Generalizations, but it does show up in the kind of investment decisions you make. And there's a third factor. You're born with a certain amount of risk aversion that you're never going to change. With my four kids, I can tell you which ones are going to be invested in bonds for the rest of their lives and which one's going to be an option trader. My oldest son is 29. He still walks down the stairs holding the banister. A fixed income guy, if you ever saw one. I might fall now, I might fall now, but right now, right? Hey. My youngest, when he was two, took off from the top stair expecting to be caught before he hit the bottom. There's an option trader right there. Okay. You know how they're, how they're marriage counseling? One of the things you should require people to do before they get married is you know, test each other's risk aversion because this is going to play out in your investment decisions for the rest of your life. What I'm trying to say is when you think about equity risk premiums, it's not a fixed number. It's going to shift over time because you know, you're going to get older. Your risk aversion is going to change. You get a shock to the system. Your risk aversion is going to change. That sounds abstract. Right? Let me put you on the spot. I'm going to think of this as the entire market. We're going to estimate the equity risk premium for the market using a very simple exercise. <coughs> so let's assume that you have some savings. This might be an assumption for some of you, but let's go along. Let's assume that, let's assume it's five years out. You have enough savings, and you have all your savings invested in something riskless, making 3% a year. I've quit my job. I've become a salesperson for the Vanguard 500 Index Fund. I want to be specific about what your alternative is. I give you a call, and they say, look, I hear you've got all your money invested in something risk-free, making 3%. Would you be interested in taking your money out of where it is right now and putting it into the Vanguard 500 Index Fund? You say, yes, conditional on something else being true. So here's what I want you to think about. You're making 3% guaranteed. What expected return? I can't guarantee the return on the Vanguard, Vanguard 500, the S&P 500. So I'm very specifically putting in the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US. What expected return would you need to make the switch? Okay, so there's no right answer. Don't look at your neighbor. So as I go through these numbers, there's, I was going to say no wrong answer, but there's one answer here that I hope none of you pick. <laughs> but the rest are all fair game, right? doesn't matter. It's percent, guaranteed, right? Whether it's dollars, euros, rupees. If it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed, right? Whether it's a default-free entity. So you're judging it against that guaranteed return, whatever currency you want. So less than 3%. Thank you, God. <laughs> if a lot of you had picked this particular answer, I'd have said, you know what? You're a lost cause. Might as well write this class off right now and move on. You can see why less than 3% would never make sense, right? If you're making 3% guaranteed, why would you ever invest in st stocks if the expected return is, the actual returns might end up being less than 3%, but the expected should be higher than 3%. Now, everything else is fair game. Between 3 and 5%, how many would accept? Are the, the one person? Are you the most risk averse person, or let me ask the rest of the class, is he the most risk averse person in the room or the least risk averse person in the room? He's the least risk averse person in the room. Okay? No, no bad connotations, least risk. Let's keep <laughs> between five and seven. Okay? Seven and nine. Looks like the middle of the distribution here. Nine and eleven. And more than eleven? most risk averse people in the room. Here's what I can predict that if their choices reflect what they truly feel, here's what I'd expect to see. When I look at your portfolio, I'm going to see more of your money invested in risky assets than the people who are you know, more risk averse. I'd see you switching into riskier asset classes quicker than everybody else. 
but you've in a sense given me your equity risk premiums, right? Because when you told me you required a return of 5%, if your guaranteed return is 3%, what have you told me your risk premium is? Five minus three is two. So basically, if I took each of your numbers, and I took a weighted average of those numbers, remember this is the entire market, out of the equity risk premium for the market, I'm saying weighted by what? Not how much enthusiasm you showed when you put up your hand, but by how much money you have. Let me be brutally honest with you. If you have no money, I don't care what your risk premium is. <laughs> you can whisper it to me, you can scream it at me, it doesn't really matter. This is not a democracy, it's a dollar-weighted democracy. Now do you see why people hang on to every word that Warren Buffett says? Because when you have $45 billion, suddenly, I mean, what he thinks about the risk premium matters more than what everybody in this building, the next three buildings, perhaps the entire neighborhood thinks about the risk premium. Because that's why 45 billion. So if this were the entire market, that's what we do, right? We go and ask each person what their expected risk premium is, weighted by how much wealth they have, and we have an equity risk premium to use in corporate finance. You see the practical problem doing this, though? This is not the entire market. There are 55 million equity investors. Even if I sent out a blanket email to all of them asking two questions, you know, what do you think stocks will do over the next year or the next five, and how much m wealth do you have? It is unlikely that I'm going to get 55 million responses or even 55 responses. And that's the struggle we face in corporate finance is how do you come up with a risk premium when you have millions of people who think very differently about the future, and they're really not telling you what they're thinking. And to show you how much, how much even getting that number is going to be difficult and keeping it up, is let's assume that if you take this weighted average, and you took this weighted average for the market, you came up with 4.7% or whatever it works out to be. Now let me add one additional fact, and let's assume that while you were sitting there, sitting here this morning, the market dropped 25%. Don't worry, nothing has happened, but let's assume it actually had happened, that you had a sudden collapse of the market. Now I asked you exactly the same question I asked you a couple of minutes ago. You're making 3% guaranteed. Would you demand, what would you demand as an expected return? Here's the question I would have for you. You gave me an answer when I asked you the question a few minutes earlier. Now that I've added this one additional fact, the market just dropped 25%, how many of you would now demand a larger premium? And why? Because you just got a sudden reminder of what risk actually is. Remember what I said last session, until you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach, Watching your portfolio melt down. Risk is an abstraction. So this is what risk is. How many of you demand a smaller premium? And your justification would be? Basically, if stocks were cheap at 26,000, they must be even cheap. This is the classic contrarian investing strategy. Very easy in the abstract to buy into, but very difficult to do in practice. Try it, actually, in the middle of a melt, um, market meltdown, try buying a stock. Your hands will stay frozen. <laughs> you want to hit the buy button on the keyboard, but it says, don't do it, don't do it. Okay? But if you can pull it off, you can actually, but my point is risk premium shift all the time. For some people, they go up. For other people, they go down, which means you cannot have a risk premium that you, inv that you estimated in 1985 that you're using today. That makes no sense to me. And there are people out there who estimated risk premiums in 1985 or 1990 or 1995, and they're still stuck with those numbers. Constancy in risk premiums is not a good feature. It's a bad feature because true risk premiums change all the time. So now that we've set up what risk premiums are and why it's difficult to estimate, let's think about ways of estimating risk premiums. The first way is to do what I just did, right? Ask you what stocks will do and back out a risk premium. It's called a survey premium. I'll show you what the research indicates, and I'll also tell you up front that almost no one out there uses survey premiums. We'll talk about why. The second and the most common way of estimating risk premiums across banks, consulting firms, corporations, is to look backwards. It's called a historical risk premium. Saying, what does that mean? What are we trying to estimate? What stocks will earn over and above something risk-free in the future, right? So in a historical premium, I tell you what stocks have earned in the past over something risk-free. 
And then you make a leap of faith. That if that's what you've earned in the past, that's what you're going to earn in the future. 95% of people who practice corporate finance use historical premiums. I think it's bad practice, and I'll talk about why, especially in 2018. Maybe in 1986 you could have gotten away with it, but that's historical premiums. And there's a third approach, which I'm going to push on you, and you can wrestle with it, and you don't like it, you can abandon it, which is I would like a forward-looking dynamic premium rather than a backward-looking static premium. Historical premium is backward-looking by definition, and it's static. It's not going to change very much on a year-to-year -year basis, because remember, if you have 80 years of history, adding an 81st year is not going to change that number that much. I'd like to give you a premium that reflects what's happening in the world right now, and is based on forward-looking judgments, <coughs> called an implied premium. Let's start with survey premiums. When you do a survey premium, obviously you can't ask everybody. There are too many investors out there. So what you do is often ask a subset of investors. So I'm going to list out some of the, some of the groups of investors that have been surveyed and what the numbers show. First, there, is a, there, you know, there used to be a, an association called the Securities Industries Association, which used to send out, I think, to 5,000 individual investors a very simple question. What do you think stocks will do over the next year? You see how that gives you an answer to the... So if they say stocks will make 10% and the T-bond rate is 2.6%, 10 minus 2.6 is 7.4%. They stopped doing this in 2004. You know why? Because they found it was completely useless. Because what it was entirely based on was the recent past. If stocks, if you'd come off a really good year from, for stocks, people said, I'm going to make 12%. If you came off a rally, so they found there was very little predictive power because investors were really not thinking ahead. They were looking at the recent past, which is human nature. Merrill Lynch has been serving institutional investors, portfolio managers, and the argument that they're more sophisticated, that they tend to think more far ahead. And they're survey you know, was, was about 4.8%. I haven't found an updated number. I think they stopped as well because they probably also found it was pointless. Campbell Harvey and, um, and John Graham, two professors at Duke, have been serving CFOs of companies, trying to get a perspective. From the company standpoint, you must be using an equity risk premium in your hurdle rates, what do you use? And they come up with a number not that different, about 4.5%. They've uh, been updating, I think, 2015, 2016. There's a professor in Spain called Pablo Fernandez who does surveys of both analysts. So he reports a premium across equity research analysts. And perhaps the most useless survey of all, he surveys academics. Why? Because what did I say in equity risk premiums? It's a weighted average. Weighted by what? How much money you have. So what's the point of asking academics? They don't bring much to the table anyway. But the reasoning being that if you teach this in class, maybe you're sending the wrong message out. No. The bottom line is no one uses these survey premiums because they tend more to reflect the past than to give you predictions for the future. And they have no limits on what you can say. So if I, because if you ask me what's the risk, what the risk premium, I can make up any number because there's no money behind it. It's a survey number. The only business where I've seen survey premiums used, and even there they seem to have stopped, is real estate. In real estate, Cushman and Wakefield used to survey real estate developers in different parts of the country. And they'd release this brochure that said, if you're investing in commercial real estate in Florida, this is what other developers in commercial real estate are requiring as a rate of return for investing in properties. The reason it used to work in real estate is the developer community was fairly small and homogeneous. You could get numbers that you could use. But even there, it's broken down because increasingly real estate has become corporatized. You've got REITs and real estate corporations. So I can't think of a single business anymore where survey premiums are used. You see them reported, but they're not used very much. Let's move on to historical premiums. Again, let me set up the process of how it's done. It's not rocket science. You take a slice of history, 20 years, 50 years, 80 years. And you say, how do I determine the slice? We'll talk about why you might pick one over the other. Then you look at, on average, what you'd have made investing in stocks over that period. So let's take over the last 50 years, you made 8% a year investing in stocks. Then you look, on average, what you'd have made investing in something risk-free. Let's say you define T-bonds as your risk-free investment. You look at what you'd have made on T-bonds. Let's say it's 3% a year for the last 50 years. 
8 minus 3 is 5, you got a historical risk premium. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? But if you use that as your forecasted premium for the future, you're making some assumptions and pretty strong ones. The first is you're assuming that your investor risk aversion is not changing much over time. That even if it spikes up, it goes back to what it used to be. And second, that the average risk stock in the market is not shifting very much either. This is called mean reversion. Mean reversion, what you assume is you assume that things will revert back to the way they used to be. Is that a good assumption? Or let me reframe the question. What has to be true for this to be a good assumption? You got to live in a world that is a pretty stable world, right? You know what, the, what finan one of finance's biggest problems is? It was developed in the US in the second half of the last century. I mean, Harry Markowitz came out in 1952. So it was really everything we know in finance, the practices were developed between 1915 through 1980. You're saying, so what? The US was the most mean reverting, stable economy of all time. You can draw a graph of, of, of GDP growth or eco economies growing over the entire history of mankind. And you get to the second half of the 20th century and you put in the US, it's like watching a patient go into a coma. Because basically you get these spikes and then you get so mean reversion worked really well between 1950 and 2000. In fact, when you had a recession in the US, people would predict the recession ends after 12 months, then you'll have three months. And so you could often almost predict how the recession would unfold and how it would end. Until 2008, I would not push back when people used historical risk premiums. Because they were making an assumption of the, of the model being structurally stable, and I said, OK, especially in developed markets. 2008 for me was a breaking point. The breaking point was that 2008 told me that the world had shifted, it had changed, that you're no longer around, you didn't have a global economy which was US centric, you had a global economy that had multiple centers of gravity. And assuming mean reversion in this world, to me, in, in every, every aspect of finance, is asking for trouble. That's why I don't buy the Schiller PE. For those of you who tracked it, Robert Schiller, who's a Nobel Prize winner, has this PE is computed for the US market going back to 1871. And starting in 2010, he's been telling us, based on that PE, that stocks are overpriced. You should, he hasn't said it, but the people who use the Schiller PE said, you should get out of stocks now, starting in 2010. I don't care whether the stocks are in a bubble or not, and we'll talk about that question, but if you'd stayed out of stocks since 2010, you made a horrifically bad investing mistake, because think of how much money you've left on the table. But the reason I have a problem with the Schiller PE is it is based on mean reversion, that things are going to revert back to the way they used to be. So when you look at historical risk premiums, remember that implicit assumption, things revert back to the way they used to be. But let me show you the numbers, because as accepting the fact that historical risk premiums are used by a lot of people. At the start of every year, I compute historical risk premiums on my website. So if you go to data, you click on it, you'll see the updated premium through 2018. It's not rocket science. I go back as far as I can. In this case, I found data going back to 1928. And most of you can find the same data. It's on the Federal Reserve website. So there are lots of different places you can find it. And I compute the returns on stocks and the returns on T-bonds and the returns on T-bills over that period. Then I compute risk premiums. The historical risk premium for the US is not one number. I'll give you 12 numbers, ranging from a low of 3% to a high of 13%. So how can it be so different? It depends on three choices I make. The first is how far back in time I go. I could go back 10 years. I could go back 50 years. And I could go back all the way to 1928, which is 90 years. In fact, I could do 10 other time periods if I wanted. The premium is different depending on the slice of history I look at. Second, the premium is going to be different depending on whether I define T-bonds, which are longer-term government bonds, or T-bills as my risk-free investment. The premium tends to be higher against T-bills than T-bonds. And finally, it's going to depend on a statistical choice I make. When I say I computed the average returns on stocks over the last 90 years, I have two ways of computing that average. The first is a simple average, where I add up the 90 numbers divided by 90. It's an arithmetic average. 
The second is I can compute a compounded average, which basically means stocks earned returns on top of previous returns. I compute a geometric average. How far back do I go? T-bills or T-bonds, arithmetic or geometric averages. Assuming you force me to use a historical risk premium, I'll tell you the choices I make and back up why I would. First, if you ask me to compute a historical risk premium for the US, I'm not going to use a 10-year number. I'm not going to use a 50-year number. I'm going to use a 90-year number, which sounds crazy. 1928 was before the Great Depression. Do you think the US equity market was a very different market then? Absolutely. Why am I going back that long? Because I have a statistical problem. It's amazing how much we forget statistics when we get into finance. When you compute an average over 90 years, if this were a statistics class and you took 90 numbers and you computed an average, what are you required to report in brackets below that number? The standard error, to tell the world how uncertain you are, right? So here's what I did. I took the risk premium for 90 years and I computed a standard error. I'll give you the good news first. If I go all the way back to 1928, my risk premium is about 4.66%, second decimal point to give you this illusion that I actually know this number with precision. But if you push me, here's what I will have to admit. See this red number, 2.22%? That is the standard error if I go all the way back to 1928. So let me throw the number out and you tell me whether you're impressed by my precision. My risk premium if I go all the way back to 1928 is 4.66%. But my standard error is 2.22%. Statistics, how do we use standard errors? You add or subtract two standard errors to get a range, right? With 95% confidence, what can I tell you? The risk premium in the US could be anywhere from 0 to 9%. That doesn't really help you very much, but that's going back 90 years. Now do you see why I didn't go back 10 years? If I went back 10 years, I could tell you the risk premium is 11%. But then I also have to tell you the standard error in that number is 5.5%, which means this is pure noise. The true premium can be 0 to 22%. 10 years in stock market history is a, is a flash of time. It's not even a period of time. It's estimated that you need about 250 years of uninterrupted history in a market that doesn't change before you can actually get a historical risk premium that you feel pretty comfortable about. Well, good luck with that. This is, I think, what people don't admit when they use historical risk. They act like it's a fact. 4.66%, it's a fact. It's not a fact, it's an estimate. There's a standard error. Be at least open about that standard error because then we can discuss how much, where in that range the true risk premium is. Now let me complete the story. I'll go back as far as I can. I'm going to use T-bonds as my risk free. Rate. Why? Because I already told you, in corporate finance and valuation, my risk-free rate is going to be a long-term bond rate. Not, so it, it would be inconsistent for me to look at the premium over T-bills if I'm using the T-bond rate as my risk-free rate. And third, why am I using geometric averages? A lot of services actually tell you you should use an arithmetic average. In fact, a lot of textbooks tell you you should use an arithmetic average. And they're right if your job is to get the equity risk premium for just one year. If you're making a single period forecast, the cost of equity for next year, the arithmetic average is the best estimate for next year. But that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this risk premium. I'm going to bring it into a hurdle rate. Then I'm going to use that hurdle rate as my discount rate to discount cash flows in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six. And if I discount my cash flows in year 10, guess what? That discount rate is going to compound. And if I'm going to use a compounded discount rate, then I should be using a geometric average or a compounded average. That's how I ended up with the 4.66%. So I can tell you what the historical risk premium is, but I wouldn't trust it further than I can throw it because it is backward looking, it is noisy. And if your model is sh shifting, there's a structural shift in the model, it doesn't even tell you much about the future. So I'm going to give you my alternative to historical risk premiums. Remember what I said about surveys? Why are they useless? Because you can say whatever you want. So rather than listen to what you say, I'm going to look at what you pay. And here's why it tells me what your risk premium is. If you take a risky asset, stock, you know, collection of stocks, and you tell me how much you pay and what the cash flows on that asset are, I can, based on what, or what you pay, tell you what your internal rate of return on those cash flows is. Basically, whatever you might think you might make, those cash flows tell you what you can expect to make as a return. 
It's a forward-looking number. It's based on future cash flows, and could it change? Yeah, you could get more scared and say, look, I'm going to offer you 20% less. I just got more nervous. That's exactly what I'm going to do with stocks. And I'm going to frame it. But first, let's a question. The question? No. Usually, the standard, standard errors go with arithmetic. Geometric averages don't have standard errors, but that doesn't mean they're precise. It's because computing a standard error when you're doing a compounded average is not there, but it's related to the. So the standard error is low on your arithmetic average. It's also going to be low on your geometric average. But I'm just translating between the two because that's all you can do. Right? Yeah. So let's think about how this would work with stocks. Foundations. Remember how you computed the yield to maturity on a bond? I know you don't remember, but you know, kind of, it's back there somewhere. Somebody want to help me out? How do you compute the yield to maturity on a bond? What did you do? The cash flows on a bond, which are very simple, right? It's coupons and face values. So unlike a stock, you don't have to make any estimation. And then what else do you have to bring in? to the price of the bond. In other words, you know the price of the bond, you know the coupons and the face value. The yield to maturity is that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows in the bond equal to the price of the bond. It's an internal rate of return for bond. You say, why do we call it yield to maturity? Just to make it look different. I'm going to steal that concept and apply it on stocks. I'm going to take you back to November of 2013. Don't worry, I'll update this number in a, in, as we go through. But I'm going to take you back to November of 2013 because many of my, my, my analyses were based in November of 2013. Okay. So in November of 2013, the S&P 500 was trading at 1,756.54. So what does that mean? That's what you paid for stocks, you being collectively all investors. So instead of buying a bond, you bought the S&P 500, which are the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US. Un Instead of coupons and face value, what are you going to get as, ex as cash flows? You're going to get dividends, but increasingly in the US, companies are returning cash in the form of buybacks. So if you think about collectively owning the S&P 500, remember, both those cash flows come to you. I cannot tell you what they will be in the future, but in the 12 months leading into November of 2013, those cash flows were about 82.35. Basically, I'm taking the cash flows. These are called index units because the S&P 500 is, is, you know, so I could give it to you in billions if you wanted, but then the market cap would also be in billions. So here's what I know. I know what you paid for stocks, 1756.54. I know what the cash flows were in the last 12 months leading into 2013. Then I bring in a final piece of the puzzle. Remember, this is about the market. So I say, look, I don't know what the right growth rate is, but I want to see what analysts are projecting as growth in earnings for the S&P 500. You're saying, what if they're wrong? It doesn't matter. That's what they're expecting. That's what I'm going to use to back out your yield to maturity. So in this case, it turned out that in, start, in November of 2013, those analysts were expecting a growth rate of 5.59% in earnings. I'm going to assume that the cash flows you got in the last 12 months will grow at the same rate as earnings, because these are collectively across all companies. So here's what I have. I know what you paid. I have your expected cash flows now for the next five years by taking the 82.35 and growing it at 5.59% for the next five years. But I cannot keep assuming that 5.59% growth forever. Why? Because if your earnings are growing at 5.59% in an economy growing at 2 or 3%, things are going to blow up on you because your earnings are then going to get bigger than the economy at some point in time. So at the end of year five, I say, look, I can't keep giving you this 5.59% growth. I'm going to assume that the growth rate in these cash flows is going to drop to the growth rate in the economy. Everything is still done in nominal terms. I'm doing it in US dollars. You're saying, how the heck are you going to get the growth rate in the economy? Well, I could ask macroeconomists, but why would I want to waste my time? They have a tough enough time telling you whether you grew last quarter. Forget about the next five. You know. So I'm not going to waste my time asking other people or doing a survey of economists. I'm going to use a proxy, and you're going to see me use this proxy over and over. What did I say goes into risk-free rate? Expected inflation, right? And then there's an expected real interest rate. So if you ask me, why is the T-bond rate 2.65%? Because inflation is about 1.5%, a real interest rate of 1.1% or 1.2%. You're saying, so what? What goes in nominal growth rate in the economy? 
expected inflation, the same expected inflation, because it can't be different for the two numbers, plus an expected real growth rate. In the long term, and this is all we're talking about here, your expected real interest rate and your expected real growth rate have to converge. Why? Because if I promise a real interest rate of 2% to people, remember real interest rate means I have to deliver in goods and services to you, and the economy is growing at only 1%, something's going to blow up on me sooner or later. The risk-free rate becomes a proxy for the nominal growth rate in the economy. I have a post on this because people obviously push back. So how, why would I? Over the last 50 years, the best predictor for nominal growth rate in the U.S. economy has been the T-bond rate at the start of the decade, every single decade. You can ask economists or you can trust the T-bond rate. You know what? I've learned to trust the T-bond rate a lot more than economists. And it gives me an easy out. I'm not sitting there at the end of year if I say, what do I use as a growth rate? I set the growth rate equal to the risk-free rate, which was 2.55% in November of 2013. I'm ready to do my calculation. I know what you pay, 1756.54. I have expected cash flows for the next five years. Beyond the fifth year, the cash flows keep growing forever at 2.55%. That's called a perpetual growth cash flow. And if you remember from your foundations class, when you have a cash flow growing at a constant rate forever, there's this equation you can use to compute the present value. We act like we invented that equation, but it comes from math, because you have an infinite series. Okay? But that's what that last term is, the expected cash flows beyond year five. What's the question I'm trying to answer? What discount rate will make the present value of those cash flows equal to the level of the index? I solved for that in November of 2013, but that number would have been 8.04%. You're saying, what does that even mean? At the, st at the start of November of 2013, if you bought U.S. stocks, I don't care what you hoped you would make, what you prayed you would make, what you thought you would make, given what you paid for stocks, you can expect to make 8.04%. Forward-looking number. I subtract other 2.55% from it. My expected risk premium then on November 1st of 2013 would have been about 5.5%. Now, here's why it matters. My end game is to get a hurdle rate for Disney in November of 2013. I have two choices. I can go with this 5.5% or I could have used a historical risk premium as of that day because in November of 2013, I had a table very much like the table you saw but updated through 2012. And that risk premium I'd have got would have been 4.2%. And this becomes my fundamental choice. Do I go with a historical risk premium of 4.2%? which reflects the U.S. market over the pre previous 85 years, or do I go with this forward-looking number? And remember, I'm sitting in November of 2013, five years after the crisis. Things are still working their way through the system. For me, it was an easy choice. I said, I'm going to go with the 5.5% because it reflects the world I live in, not the world I wished I lived in. Go ahead. No, but remember, what did I say about analyst estimates? Even if they're wrong, what am I trying to do? I'm computing an internal rate of return for the market given the expectations, right? So if I use, let's say, let, let's say I could come up with a growth rate that's more intrinsically driven based on what companies are doing. And I put my growth rate in there instead of the analyst estimates. I wouldn't be solving for a market expectation. So I'm not even saying this is the right value. I'm saying this is what the price of risk is in the market. I'm not going to use it to value stocks individually, but I need to back out the price of risk. So that's my rationale for using analyst estimates. It's not that they're right. In fact, one way I try to protect myself against some of the bias is there are two ways you can get analyst estimates for future growth in the S&P 500. One is called bottom-up, where you take individual companies, take analyst growth rates for those companies, and take an average. That average tends to be upward biased because Analysts, for some reason, don't think about the macro when they forecast the micro. They act like their company is the only one moving, and they make projections. I use what are, what, what, what are called top-down estimates, which are analysts who track the entire index. There are about a dozen of them. They're not big names, but they actually all they do is forecast growth and earnings. There, there's no bias, but there are mistakes in either direction. But the reason I want to use those analyst estimates is I'm trying to get a price of risk in the market now so I can use it in my value. So that is, those are the two choices. And essentially, in November of 2013, I went with the 5.5%. So for my US operations, that's going to be my risk premium. But remember, I have a Chinese company, an Indian company, a Brazilian company. 
I need risk premiums with China, India, and Brazil. You're saying, why don't you use a historical risk premium? Why can't I? Well, remember, even in the US, with 90 years, I said lots of standard error. You're not going to get 90 years of data to begin with in any of those countries. There is no market outside the US. Even the European markets don't have a deep enough history because the Second World War, many of those markets shut down. You have a break in the history. So outside the US, it's almost impossible. If you, so if your only tool is historical risk premiums, you're going to be stuck. So if I came to you with a Brazilian company and I said, what risk premium should I use? You have two choices. One is to ask me to come back in about 80 to 85 years and say, now I'll have a historical data, I can use that premium. Or you can try to do something today. My suggestion is you do something today, and I'll give you a couple of ways in which you might be able to get a risk premium for a country. Start with the US premium. Let's say you can you know, know that. Whether it's 5.5 or 4.2%, make your choice. You got a risk premium for the US. If you have a country which has, you know, which has no, which has, which has no historical data, start with that five and a half percent. But if you can then tell me how much additional risk premium you would charge for that country, we'll set that estimation question. We'll deal with that estimation question next. You can add that to the five and a half percent to come up with the risk premium for your country. So five and a half percent will then become a base, not just for the U.S. but for any market that you deem mature. And then any market that you think is riskier, you're going to add on top of the 5.5%. Does that make sense to you? So no country will then have a risk premium lower than 5.5%. Some might have a risk premium equal to 5.5%, but many will have risk premiums greater than 5.5%, which leaves open this estimation question of how the heck am I going to estimate risk premiums for Brazil and India and Vietnam and Cambodia and Nigeria? Well, we do have a country risk measure we've already used once, right? We came up with a default spread for countries. We used it in a different context, get a risk rate. Hey, it's there. Why not use it again? In fact, that is often the state of the art in investment banking equity risk premiums. They take a base premium for the US, and they add the default spread for the country to the US premium. So let's take my, you know, the three countries that I have in my, at least the base countries, you know, India, China, and Brazil. I have default spreads that I looked up based on their rating. I could have used a sovereign CDS spread. Or what, so remember, I said make a choice. I could take the default spreads that I've got, add them to the US risk premium, and I'd have a risk premium for each of those countries. So basically, the US premium comes either from a historical premium or an implied premium. On top of that, I'm adding the default spread. So 25 years ago, when I started seeing this practice, I understood why people were doing it. Because you wanted an observable measure of country risk. This was out there. You could see it. The only problem is this is the spread you're charging for what? For buying a government bond issued by India or China or Brazil. But that's not what you're thinking about doing. You're thinking about investing in equities in each of these countries, right? So let me ask you a generic question. If you're charging 2.25% for investing in an Indian government bond, would you charge more or less for investing in Indian equities? I would think so, right? Equities are riskier than bonds. If you're charging 2.25% for buying a government bond, I would expect you to demand more. Which leaves me open to the next question, how much more? So here's what I started doing about, you know, when I first ran into this problem. I said, if I could somehow come up with a measure of how risky equities are relative to government bonds, I could do an algebra problem. And here's what the algebra problem would look like. Let's say the standard deviation in Brazilian equities over the last two years, or the last five, pick your time period. I usually use two years because it's right there in Bloomberg. I can look up the standard deviation is 21%. Let's say the standard deviation in the government bond, the Brazilian government bond, is 14%. You ready for the algebra problem? On the 14% bond, the spread you were charging was 2%. Equities are one and a half times riskier, 21 divided by 14. One and a half times 2% is 3%. You add that on. See, it's just one step more than what people typically do. People usually stop at the default spread. I'm scaling it up to reflect the fact that equities are riskier than bonds, and that then becomes my measure of the country risk premium. And that allows me to get a country risk premium of 8.5% for Brazil, 6.94% for China, and 9.1% for India. But none of this is going to take away from the fact that my starting number is still the default spread. And I'll talk about some of the limitations of doing that. But I do it because it's the only country number that I can use in this directly. There might be other ways of getting country risk, but they tend to be numerical scores. 
this is a percentage number that allows me to build up to a risk premium. So let me actually finish the story. Do you have a AAA rating then? Let's say you're Germany or Australia. What's your spread going to be? It's going to be 0% because sovereign AAA ratings mean you're default free. If you have a 0% default spread, the risk premium you're going to end up with will be 5.5% plus 0, which is 5. So any country which has a AAA rating then will end up with a risk premium equal to the US. And the reason I think that makes sense, if you have a dozen mature markets, let's, let's assume these AAA markets are all mature. You cannot have different equity risk premiums across mature markets. And here's why. If Germany's equity risk premium is 6% and the US equity risk premium is 4.5%, and they're both mature markets. What's going to happen? Money is going to leave the lower risk premium market and go to the higher one. So I'm going to start off with the presumption that if you're mature markets, you should share a risk premium. I'm using the S&P 500 as a base, not because I'm parochial, but because the S&P 500 has more information on it that I can use. Because remember, I need the growth rates and the cash flows. That's much more difficult. I actually have done it for. I did it for the FTSE right around the Brexit vote, and I'm planning to do it again around March 29th or whichever the shifting date is, because it's a great way of kind of isolating the effect of risk around what happens to the market. So here's my composite way. Yeah. Yeah, the question is why don't, remember how I did the implied premium for the US? Why not do that for India and China? I wish I could, and here's the biggest limitation. I can get the index, obviously, today. I can get the cash flows last year, obviously, today. What's the third number I need to complete the story? I need an expected growth rate. And once you go outside the US, that becomes messier and messier. A lot of companies, uh, countries, you have growth rates projected for one year. Five-year growth rates are typical in the US that are uncommon outside. I could cheat, and this is how I did it for India to get an equity risk for India. I took those stocks that have ADRs listed in the US and took a growth rate from those ADRs, but it's only a subset of the index. One of these days, I will be able to do that because I agree with you. That's a much more dynamic, forward-looking approach, but for the moment, we're kind of stuck with what we have right now. So let me summarize the process. I start off with an implied premium for the US. That becomes my base premium. If you're a AAA rated country, I give you the same risk premium on the argument that you're a mature market and therefore you should have the same risk premium. If you're not AAA rated, I look up a default spread for your country either by looking at your rating or by looking at the sovereign CDS spread or looking at a government bond denominated in dollars. And if I can, I scale up the default spread for the fact that equity is riskier than bonds to come up with an equity risk premium. So here's what the world looked like to me in November of 2013. I'll show you what the world looks like right now. But in November of 2013, here's what the world looked like to me. Let's start with the numbers that, that should be easy. US and Canada both have 5.5%. Why? Because Canada is AAA rated. So I give them the, the Canadians don't like it. I'm supposed to be, they want to be separate and different. But let's face it, I mean, you're AAA rated. I'm not going to use a Toronto Stock Exchange to compute my implied premium. I'm going to use the S&P 500. And notice the 5.5% pops up all over the place. It pops up in Asia when I look at Singapore. Why? Because Singapore is the only AAA rated country in Asia. Any AAA rated country, you're going to see 5.5%. Saying, what's the red number? That is the additional country risk premium that I add to the 5.5%. So any AAA rated country, that's going to be 0% and I add to 5.5%, I get the same risk premium as the US. And the rest of the world, basically, I use exactly the same approach to get the risk premium. You say, why are you looking at the rest of the world? All you need is India, China, and Brazil. Is that true? I have a company in India, I have a company in China, and a company in Brazil, right? Vale is a Brazilian company, but it's an iron ore mining company. It gets its revenues all over the world. Disney is a US company, but it gets revenues from the rest of the world. I need the world in front of me to be able to value or analyze any company because companies get their revenues. Welcome to globalization. 30 years ago, you didn't have to do this. In most companies, you just stayed local. That is not even an option anymore. And that's why you need the picture of the rest of the world. Yes? Uh, AAA rated countries can still have different inflation. That doesn't matter. Currency is not the issue. Risk what premium, is no, no, risk free, risk free rate, I'm not, you can use whatever risk free rate you want. So you're doing Australian dollars, use a higher risk-free rate. I'm not stopping you. This is on top of whatever risk-free rate you picked, right? 
So inflation can be different. But I'm a set, I'll give you the flaw though in this approach. What am I using to measure country risk? Your default risk, right? I think I consistently underestimate risk premiums for Middle Eastern countries using this approach. Think about why. If you look at Saudi Arabia in 2013, I get a very low risk premium. Why? Because Saudi Arabia has a high rating. Why does it have a high rating? There's not much default risk in the country. But if you're investing in Saudi equities, especially in 2018, do you see the danger of using default risk as your proxy for risk in equities? Your yeah, risk now could be political turmoil. Who knows what comes out of that? I mean, overnight you can go essentially from a... So there is that flawed default risk, and that troubles me. There w that's why I can't wait for the day where I can do implied premiums for every country, because I am building off a flawed measure of country risk, and I'm going to understate risk in countries, which have a lot of political risk, but not much default risk. So let me complete the story. I've gone my risk premiums for countries. This is how I'm going to use them. Disney is one of my companies. I need an equity risk premium for Disney to come up with a hurdle rate. It's a US company, but in 2013, it got 82% of its revenues in the US and Canada. I've lumped them up because they both have the same risk premium. It gets about 11.64% in Europe. You're saying, can't you be more precise? Hey, it's not my problem. It's not my fault. That's how they broke themselves down. And if you look at the previous page, you'll actually see that I have risk premiums for regions of the world. Those risk premiums are weighted average risk premiums of the countries in each region. You know weighted by what? GDP. Why do I use GDP? Because if I'm looking at the risk premium for Asia, I want to weight China a lot more than Vietnam because it's a much bigger part of Asia. And the reason I compute the regional average is a lot of companies don't break revenues down by country. They break it down by region. And you can see with, a with Disney, they break it down to four regions. I've taken the equity risk premium for each region, and I've taken a weighted average using how much revenue they get in each region. So ask me the question, why did I use revenues? You weren't even thinking about the question, but I'm asking the question of myself. Why do you think I use revenues? Because desperation drives you there. It's the only number most companies will actually break down geographically. Some companies do break EBITDA down. I would not trust those numbers further than I can throw them. And here's why. To get from revenues to EBITDA, somebody, the expenses have to be allocated, right, across regions. Who's allocating them? Some accountant of the company. They're probably being very objective in their allocation, right? For some reason, Ireland seems to always have very profitable, and so you could, could it have something to do with taxes? I think so. So the reason I focus on revenues is it's available for most companies and it's the least contaminated by accounting choices. And the other good thing about revenues is they can never be negative. You know why that's important, right? If I gave you EBITDA by region and Asia had a negative EBITDA, how the heck are you going to weight these if you have a negative number in the mix? I'll tell you the one exception where I don't use revenues. You come to me with an oil company and you ask me to compute equity risk premium for the oil company. Remember, oil companies sell their oil into a global oil market. They don't sell to countries. So where does that risk come from? It comes from where you get the oil, right? You get a lot of oil in Kazakhstan. I'm getting a little nervous about what's going to happen the next year, the next five years. You get 30% of your oil from Nigeria. I have to be, you know, with the, especially with the elections happening or not happening right now. That could be a factor. So with oil companies, I, I actually compute an equity risk premium based on where they get their oil. And that they do break down. So if you look at oil company annual reports, they'll tell you where they get the oil from. So I, I'm not rigid about using revenues. If you can find something else, where the factories are, where the production is, and you want to use that, all the more power to you. But you do want to bring in operating risk when you look at equity risk premiums. Yes? If you had perfect information, you'd probably get cash flows by region because that's where your risk comes from. You'd actually value each region separately and use that to weight. But it's almost circular because to do all of that stuff, you need the equity risk premium in the first place. So if I had a perfect world, that's what I'd do. I'd value each part of the world and come up with weights based on that. Any other questions? Now let's look at the remaining companies. 
with Bookscape. Remember that independent bookstore in New York City? I said, thank you, God. You know, it's all people in the US. Even that, though, I'll give you the shades of gray. There might be a lot of tourists who go into that. So if I really wanted to make my life really difficult, I could sit at the, on the stand at the doorway and say, where are you from? And take a weighted average. Okay? And we'll talk about it, because Disney theme parks, this is going to become an issue. Because technically, if you have a theme park in Anaheim, you're saying, why would I care about exchange rates and country risk? Why should you? Because 35% of the people who come into Disneyland come from Asia. 35% of the people who come into Orlando come from Latin America and Europe. If you think you're immune from country risk just because you have your business in a country, even that is open to question. So with each of my companies, here's what I did. With Bookscape, I used the US and said, I hoped and prayed it wasn't all tourists coming in and buying the books. With Vale, remember I called them a Brazilian company? Well, they're not quite. They're a Chinese company masquerading. This is going to be true for a lot of companies. In what sense? Their biggest market is China. Why? Because they sell iron ore, which means that if you have a lot of construction of infrastructure, so as China slows, guess what's going to happen to Bali? It's going to slow as well. What you're trying to build into your analysis is the recognition of where you do business, because that's going to affect your cash flows and your value. With Tata Motors, almost a Chinese company. In fact, I think this year, the China portion of revenues exceeded the Indian portion of revenues. My point is we, we have to step back from this notion of Indian and Chinese. I mean, the way I describe it is we have a bunch of multinationals around the world that through the accident of history happen to be incorporated and trade in a particular market. So, and my job is to make sure that I get past that and look at where they actually do business. So my risk premiums. With Deutsche, I actually took their breakdown of where they go, where their, their loans and financial services. It's messier than the rest. But with every company, I'm looking at where you do business to come up with your risk premium. Now let me complete this. Until 2008, I used to compute the equity. Remember the base number for all of these is that implied premium for the US, at least the way I do it. So until 2008, I used to do it at the start of every year for the US and use it for the rest of the year. You know what my defense was when somebody asked, why don't you update it more often? I would say it's a developed market, and the price of risk doesn't change very much in a developed market over short periods. So what can happen? And I think the gods are just waiting for you to say stuff like this to tell you what can happen. Because I got a reminder of how much things can change even in a developed market starting on September 12th of 2008. That was, of course, the day before the crisis. And if you say, what crisis? Your amnesia is kicked in completely. You'd be amazed. I was in an investment bank a couple of years ago, and I said, the 2008 crisis was a bank. I said, what crisis was that? I said, well, no, that, that we forget things that quickly in markets. September 12th of 2008, the equity risk in the US is 4.37%. That was the weekend before the Lehman collapse. And we came into September 15th to a nightmare. And here's how I kept the nightmare alive for myself every day for the rest of the year. Every day as I would come in on the train to work, I'd compute the implied equity risk premium for that day. You know what? See how much it could change in one day. This is what happens in a crisis. In a crisis, it's not cash flows that are changing. When you see the market down 7% in a day, cash flows did not change during the course of a day. It's a price of risk that can change on the drop of a hat. That, to me, is the definition of crisis. And this is something I've taken to doing every time we've gone into a crisis. So last year, for instance, I did this in February, March, when you had the Facebook, the tech company meltdown. I did it again in October, when you had those day-to-day -day huge movements in the market. It keeps me kind of go back. It forces me to go back to basics and say, OK, now that this crisis happened, what's the price of risk today? So starting in September of 2008, I've been doing these implied premiums the start of every month rather than every year. So if you go to my website, on the front page of the website, you'll see the implied equity risk premium for the US, for the S&P 500, at the start of February 2019. I'm going to send you that Excel spreadsheet so you can see the numbers play out. Because here's what my implied premium looked like at the start of this year. The S&P was at 2506.85. January 1st, 2019. I'm doing exactly what I did at the start of 2000, you know, in November of 2013. I got the expected cash flows. Notice how much of my cash flows come in the form of buybacks. 
In 2018, the trailing 12 months leading into the start of 2019, almost 65% of my cash flows took the form of buybacks, 35% were in dividends, the collective cash flows. I put in a growth rate, which was only 4%. And in fact, that collapse in the expected growth happened in the last two months of last year. It was 8% at the start of November, but in the last two months, remember all the, the turmoil, that growth rate was had, which tells you that analysts are in fact reacting to what's happening, which is what I want to make sure I bring into my numbers as well. My equity risk premium based on those numbers was about 5.96% at the start of this year. Every company I valued in January of 2019, I used 5.96%. What's happened to the S&P 500 since the start of this year? It's up about 10%. So if I keep everything else con, cash flows haven't changed dramatically. If I'm now looking at an index that's 10% higher, what's going to have happen to my equity risk premium? It's going to go down. In fact, if you take a look at the equity, think about bond prices and interest rates. As bond prices go up, interest rates go down. Same thing here. As stock prices go up, the equity risk premium. The equity risk premium at the start of February was about 5.56%. I would not be surprised at the start of March. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself it were down to 5.4% because February's been a pretty good month for stocks as well. Yes? So if the rate derives basically you have the, the three points yeah. as a function of the price right. and the analyst rating, but the analyst rating is not updated daily. Yeah, that's the problem is I can update the S&P 500, I can update the T-bond rate, but the cash flows are updated only once every quarter, right? Dividends and buybacks don't get updated every day. And the analyst growth rates get updated whenever they feel like updating. So I've got to, the way I see it, this is the most updated number I can for each single number, accepting the fact that there's gonna be this timing difference. So in a crisis where cash flows are dropping, I might not be capturing the extent of the crisis. So I'll send you the spreadsheet. I'd like you to take a look at it because it'll give you a sense of what I'm trying to do. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And you can actually change the number to today's S&P 500 and solve for the equity risk premium today. You don't have to change anything else. So give it a shot. Huh? Because if you do a GDP weighted average, oh, uh, Eastern I Europe is not even going to register, right? Because they're so small relative to but in increasingly, I think companies have to, when they take Eastern Europe, they put them in with Europe, when they, when they do the Middle East, Asia, they often put Eastern Europe and Russia into those. So companies follow different procedures on how they break down revenues. But usually when they do Europe, it's usually Western Europe. Red line is it? That is the S&P 500. No, but that's the return. On the no, no, it's not the return. It's the level of the S&P 500. The green line is the implied equity risk premium. So as the index drops, the equity risk premium rises. So that's every day, right? So every day the index is different. So the close of every day, it's going to be a different number. Yes. They are usually in dollars or euros. So that's that's a fundamental inconsistency. So in fact, if you want to stay dollar based, then you have to do your entire cost of capital in dollars first, and then we'll talk about a way in which you can convert to any other currency using the inflation rate. Yeah. Right. There is that inconsistency because it's not even current. It's not even currency risk. It's when you have high inflation or currency, subtracting out a dollar spread, even if it's a right spread, will be too low, right? Because the spreads have to be scaled up, and that's what you can do if you do it at the last stage of the process. You do everything in dollars. Use a T-bond rate as a risk-free rate, risk premiums, everything in dollars. You come up with the cost of capital for a Vietnamese company in dollars. Then you give me the inflation rate in Vietnamese dong and inflation rate in U.S. dollars. There's actually a scaling mechanism I can use, which will scale everything up to that higher inflation. And what that does, it scales up the risk premium, scales up the default switch, everything gets scaled up if you're a high inflation currency, which I think makes more sense. Hi. Sorry, another quick question on the cash flow. The baseline cash flow is dividend and buyback. Buyback. Are those isn't buyback the consolidated for the whole market? 
all, all per 500 share. per index unit. Remember, this is the S&P 500. You didn't share the S&P okay, It's it. for the, in so act like you're buying every single S&P 500. You own 100% of the equities in every single company. 